Welcome to my sewing room. We have a really fun and interesting show for you today. The title of the show is Smocked Bishops. Now, I bet some of you are saying, now, Martha, what is a bishop and what is smocking? Well, let me show you the answer to both of those questions right now. A smocked bishop when you talk about smocking, that is embroidery on the top of little pleats. Now then, when I say a smocked bishop, the smocking goes around in a circle, and don't worry, I'm going to unravel these mysteries in a few minutes about how it gets how it gets this way. And smocking is using embroidery on top of pleats. Now let me turn this around for you and show you what the back looks like. On a smocked bishop, the smocking goes all the way around the back as well as all the way around the front. This is one of the cutest styles for the little girls, oh, up to about age five or six, or maybe even seven. Joanna loved them when she was little. Now then, this is a little smocked bishop bubble done on a little print, almost a little quilting print. This little print has orange and peachy tones in it. Let me turn it around once again so you can see, let me tuck the little plaque underneath there, that the smocking goes all the way around to the back, and that is what makes it a smocked bishop. Now this little smocked bishop opens down the front, so it is a front opening bishop. Can you see the sweet little colors of blue and pink and peach and this little placket that goes down the front? Once again, let me turn it around for you so you can see how sweet it is. The smocking goes all the way around the back also. Now this little dress is quite elegant. It ha it's white, it has this beautiful little shiny pink sash. Now the smocking on this one is really a bishop, but it's a bishop collar. It is a round collar that is smocked all the way around, but let me show you underneath, it is just a plain dress. It is not a bishop underneath. Let me turn it around to the back and show you how the smocking comes all the way around to the back. This is one of the most elegant smock dresses that I have in my collection. It's done out of a peach Swiss batiste. And let me show you the smocked bishop. The smocking goes right around the collar with blue smocking and tiny little peach bullion rosebuds. And then it goes right around to the back just as beautifully and comes down into a little point in the back. Now, I hope I've answered your questions on what is a bishop and what is smocking. Now, if you'll travel with me over to the technique boards, I'll make a lot of these things a lot more clear. What does a smocked bishop look like before it gets all that beautiful embroidery on it? Well, now watch out. Here we go. This is what that little size two smocked bishop looks like before we pleat it with the smocking machine and put all of that beautiful embroidery on it. Okay, after we pleat it on the smocking machine, this is what I do. I take a, a board, if you have one. If not, you can just kind of lay it out sort of the neck size. And I block it, and I take my iron, I put the iron on top of it, steam press it, and then I pull up the threads after running it through the pleating machine. I pull up the threads and tie it off. So in other words, I'm blocking the smocking before I get ready to work with it. Now there are several things you can do to finish the sleeves on a smock dress. Number one, you can simply stitch lace on the bottom, and I've used the Martha's Magic technique for that, and that's a pretty way to finish the sleeves. And then I like to run pleating through the sleeves so I can put a little smocking on the sleeves also. That is method number one. Now method number two is very easy, and this is a quick and easy elastic trick for you. If I'm going to put elastic in this sleeve, I draw my elastic line on there, and then look at the length of this piece of elastic. Flat, it stretches a lot longer than that sleeve, and there's a reason for that. When I stitch this elastic on the easy way, I will put it down on the line, and I will zigzag over the elastic. Do not catch the elastic. Go zig and zag and zig and zag. And then, look at the little trick down here. I can simply gather it up and slip my elastic, and I get the gathered sleeves just like this, and actually it is not stitched down to the, uh, to the sleeve at all, just simply over, I mean not to the elastic, simply over the sleeve. Now then, I want to show you how easy it is to do a placket. A very, very simple placket. All right, here's the back of the dress and the blue fabric. Of course, I'm not going to put blue on this mock dress, but this is the placket. You open up the back of the dress, slip it all the way over to the edge of the placket. Now then, I go along here and I straight stitch down 
and then I trim away the excess fabric and then I simply fold the placket back. Now you'll notice I use the selvage edge, so all I have to do now is just hand whip it. And here is the finished placket over here that has been hand whipped down. Let me show you another really wonderful trick. If you want to put these little elastic, um, the little elastic uh, sort of buttonholes in the back, it's a little elastic cord that holds the buttons, button loops like this, it's very easy to do. After I stitch the placket down, in other words, I brought it over to the edge and stitched it down, then I lay my little loops down, and with a magic purple pen or blue pen, I come in here and I mark one loop, I make a little mark where the second one goes, I make a little mark where the third one goes. Now. At this point, I come in and take a little seam ripper and rip out where that mark was, two or three little parts of that seam, one, two, three, where I can stick my little loops in. Now see there, I, had, I was able to stick them in. Let me move my fingers out of the way. I was able to stick them in and pull them through. There are my little button loops. And after that, I go back and straight stitch once again along that line where I picked out those little threads. And look, then I can fold the whole placket back and I have the neatest little loops you've ever seen. Here it is in finished version down here on the little white dress. This is what it looks like with those darling little button loops in there. And then of course, I will come in here on this side. Let me unpin this. I will come in here on this side and I will put my buttons and that will make a beautiful finish. The last step of finishing the little bishop dress will be putting the bias binding on the neckline. I'm going to quickly show you this, but Claudia is going to show you in just a minute. Stitch it down, trim it, and then fold it back over. I am so happy to have as my guest today, Claudia Newton. Claudia is one of the top designers in the heirloom sewing industry and one of the finest seamstresses I know also. Claudia, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Martha. What we're going to talk about in a little more detail is to finish up that placket and put on the neck binding because it's as simple as Martha showed you, but when you get home and look at yours for the first time, it can be a little bit intimidating. So we're going to go through that and show you what it actually looks like when you construct it. The first thing I want to show you is that after you put in the placket, you can fold so that the two edges are even from top to bottom, and we stitch a little dark right across the bottom of that placket. So let me stitch it for you now in dark thread so you can see how that'll look. And Martha, can I borrow your scissors? I've come sure, off with none. Sure, of course you can borrow my scissors. Right here they are. Well, there. You would straight stitch across this. My machine was set for zigzag. But once you straight stitch across it, this is the shape of your dart. And what that does is to hold the placket together at the bottom. Because now what you're going to do is to turn, if this is right side out, turn the right placket to the inside so that when the dress is finished, it laps right over left and your placket is hidden. Now to finish the neck edge, you keep that right placket turned to the inside. And remember how Martha showed you to cut your bias at a 45 degree angle to your straight grain. Then when it comes out, it's going to have these funny little points on the end of it. You want to clip them across so that you have a square edge on there. Once you get to that point, you're ready to put the binding on. This one is made for a quarter, an eighth of an inch finished binding, so we've cut it just a touch over an inch and an eighth if you need a guideline. Fold it in half with the long edges even. You want about a half inch to extend off the edge of the, the garment. And line the cut edges up with the top pleating row, which you remember is your holding row, and it is not smocked. So you've got this holding row on top. Put the edges of the binding just even with that. You can pin it in place, but right now to save time, I'm just going to run mine right through here. This is a straight stitch with an eighth of an inch seam. And I'm going to do just a little section here to show you. If your pleats are in nice and tightly, then you're going to be able to just put your binding on as is. If they're not, you may want to back smock that top row. The next thing I'm going to do is to run a zigzag, and I've got my machine set for my zigzag now, along the seam that you just sewed. 
then you take the fabric out. You trim away this fabric above the seam. Then you turn the binding to the back. And I want to show you on a larger piece exactly how this looks. This is the end that I'm coming to, and I have my half inch extension here. You simply fold that end in, wrap the other edge over it. If the ends stick out like this, on the back side, simply tuck them up under there so they're hidden. Stick a stitch, stick a pin in, I'm sorry, to hold it so that then you can come back and whip it. Well, Claudia, that is just fascinating. And you know those beautiful bindings around the neck of a bishop dress, I think are one of the best ways to finish them and have them they really are. look professional. They're very tailored to go with the smocking stitches. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. And next, I have a really elegant and very easy craft for you. There are several ways to make beautiful embellished books which now are so popular for decorative accessories. I have some ideas to share with you. The first book I have here actually looks as if it is an old scrapbook. You see it just has plain pages but isn't old. It was made in, in Taiwan. Now then I've glued on here roses and a little charm and antique picture and I've glued on an antique, uh, an antique picture which makes it look as if it's an antique book. The second one I have to share with you, it really is an antique book called English Orphans. Now, what I did for the laces on the corners, I just pulled a piece of my French lace around, glued it and put a little rosebud, and then glued uh, silk ribbons and other gold embellishment down to make a pretty one. The next book, which is really sort of an antique book, not terribly old, I think is wonderful also. I've used braid, glued down the side, a beautiful piece of lace, a charm, and another a silk rose, which makes it absolutely beautiful. Now, perhaps you have an old book, which you think, well, that, I really would like to preserve this book, but Martha, I don't want to glue anything on this book. Well, I have another idea for you. This book is a beautiful old, old book of needlework, so I really didn't want to glue anything on the book, but yet I really thought it'd be wonderful to have it out in my living room. So, instead of gluing, I simply have a piece of crocheted lace right here just laid on the book. I have a piece of ribbon wrapped around it with a little embellishment. Actually, I did just pin that onto the ribbon, and look, I stuck the little picture right up here in the top. Now, this, if I pick it up, it's going to fall apart, but guess what? I'm not going to pick it up. I'm going to leave it on my table in my living room just as a beautiful embellishment. Now, those are three ways to, really, I, actually, it was four ways to embellish books, either gluing or not gluing. And now I have a really, really nice home decorating idea for you. I am not a very good shopper. As a matter of fact, I hate to shop except for one place. I love antique stores. And the idea for today's home decorating came from my love of linens and clothes and just wonderful goodies in an antique store. This project, and I have two of them to show you, shows what you can do if you have uh, antique pillowcases, which actually I use them on my bed to sleep on too. I just love them so much. But what do you want to do if you want to use them for something else? This little pillowcase has a part of an antique pillowcase on the top. Now the back is just purchased fabric, so actually I only used the little lady that was on the pillowcase. Here is another example of using a former pillowcase to make a really pretty pillow. Let me pull it back here so your little pillow is stuffed right in. In this case, I used all of the pillowcase fabric. Here is all you do to make this pillowcase. Here is my original pillowcase. All right, I cut it down because it's too wide. I open it up, cut it down, and here is how I keep the original trim that went all the way across the pillowcase. I cut the pillowcase down, trim the seam down along the, the trim, the crocheted trim, pink crochet trim in this case, fold it back up to my new width, and then I will straight stitch it or zigzag it down, and that way I will have an absolutely beautiful pillowcase to use on my bed, well, pillow to use on my bed, that is a little bit different, and I have found that I can salvage this beautiful embroidery off of pillowcases. And now then, I have a spectacular doll dress to share with you.
since today is the Smocked Bishop Day, it certainly seemed appropriate that my adorable little doll would have a Smocked Bishop too. This little Smocked Bishop has several features I'd like to share with you how to make. And first of all, it has a little bit of gathered lace around the neckline, of course, just some precious smocking. Her little sleeve has a smocking uh, around the bottom of the sleeve, as well as this beautiful little trim with entredeau on the bottom and embroidery floss run through it. Coming down to the bottom of the dress, you'll see another adorable trim on the bottom. The same entredeau trim, and this little entredeau trim is stitched on with a beautiful machine feather stitch. Let's review one more time what a bishop dress looks like. Now you saw what the little girl dress looked like. I have to peek over this. You saw what the little girl dress looked like. This is what the doll dress looks like, pulled out. Now then, I will show you what happens after you run the threads in to make it get small enough to fit a doll. After you run the pleating threads in, you kind of pull them up like this and then you straighten them out a little bit. And some of you are saying, now Martha, how did those pleating threads get in there? Well, that's what I'm gonna share with you next. This is a pleater for English smocking. I'm going to turn the bars. You see, this is straight back here and this is much shorter than my real dress would be. This is just for purposes of demonstration. I turn the bars, now my fabric is all out, I've loaded the needles, and I come in here and I pull the fabric, I pull the fabric off of the needles, and that is how you do the pleating, and you go ahead and pull the whole thing off. That is how you do the pleating for English smocking. That beautiful little trim on the bottom is done like this. I stitch my entredeau trim on. See those little holes in the entredeau? If I would like to make something real special, like on this little, this little doll dress, I'm going to run the needle in and out, and in and out each one of the holes, and have a pretty, pretty trim like this. Okay, next little treatment. I'm going to do the feather stitch um, on this fold back line right here. Hang on. Now this is going to be in brown thread so you can see it real easily. Now I do not have to use stabilizer for this feather stitch and I'll tell you why. I have a folded hem with a couple of layers in there which will stabilize it. Normally when I do feather stitch I do use a stabilizer. But this is how I put the, uh, how I decorated the bottom trim when the little trim was added to the bottom of the skirt. It was with a beautiful feather stitch. There is another little feature on this dress that I think is really sweet too, and I'll demonstrate for you on another smocked bishop. The gathered lace edging has been whipped on the dress right behind the bias binding. You simply pull up the lace in some gathers, take your needle and go along here and whip it right along. Can you see how pretty that is to add just a little bit of a lace edging around the top of this bishop dress? You know, there's not a lot to making bishop dresses. It just takes someone to share with you a little bit, a few of the techniques. And I have always loved bishop dresses for little girls. They're so sweet on, on little tiny newborns as well as on six and seven year olds. You, of course, just make them a different size. And needless to say, my doll looks precious in her smocked bishop too. Now there's one more little angle about smocked bishops I'd like to share with you at this point. This is a round yoke smocked collar. It really isn't a smocked bishop. But, and this is a detachable collar on this darling little dress we have in the series. But since it goes all the way around, I'd like to show you how a smocked collar that goes all the way around works. Let me show you the sleeves on this dress too. They are so sweet. They have little bullion rosebuds, little lazy daisies, and then the same trim as the collar is stitched and gathered and stitched to the bottom and silk ribbons run through it. Let me refresh your memory one more time on smocking in the round as we might call it. First of all, you run your pleating threads in your collar as many rows as you want and then you slip these pleating threads up and block them. You remember how we did that in a circle with a little peach dress a few minutes ago? Then I come back in and cut a bias strip to do the bias binding on the neckline of this detachable collar. At that point, I fold the bias strip in half. Now, can you see how I lined it up on the first one of the pleating rows? Let me open this up just a little bit. The pleating rows are right here. There's one, two, three, four, and on down. I line this folded bias strip up even on this first pleating row. Then I stitch along that pleating row. 
Then comes the zigzag stitch. Let me hold this one out of the way. Then comes the zigzag stitch right above it, and then comes the trimming. So my neckline looks like this, and at that point, I fold my folded bias over, and I have a nice, pretty, very narrow trim. Now let's come back one more time and look at this collar after I put that beautiful bias binding around the top of this detachable collar. Do you see how pretty that is? You need it nice and tiny. Big old fat bias bindings around a collar are really just not pretty at all. So I really love the look of a smocked collar. And one of the great things about this smocked collar, of course, it comes right off. And guess what? When your little girl outgrows this dress, you can use this collar and do another dress for her, and you don't have to do all the handwork. I'd like to invite you along to my attic now. Some of you may recognize my antique garment for the day as the one that stands on a regular basis in my sewing room. We've had so many people to call and say, Martha, what is that beautiful antique garment that's in the background? Well, I'm going to share it with you. It was given to me by my friend Julia Rhodes of York, Pennsylvania. This particular garment, which is called a combing coat, came from her husband's family that has been many generations in Philadelphia. The coat was used by a woman uh, in the morning as she was getting dressed. She put this on to protect her clothes as she combed her hair. As you can see, this magnificent embroidery, which comes down the front of the coat, is just almost indescribable. Every bit of this embroidery is by hand. I'd like to hold this sleeve out here. I think it is absolutely magnificent. It's just a loose sleeve, not a long sleeve. Look at this wonderful buttonhole stitch that comes all the way around the edge, and then these magnificent flowers that are hand embroidered all over the sleeves. Coming down the coat is just as magnificent as the sleeves. This wonderful hand embroidery just goes all the way around, all the way down to the bottom of this beautiful combing coat. I was just so grateful for this gift and so appreciative, and, and Julia just said that she would like to share it with the world, and I thought to have it over here in the sewing room would share it with the world best. We have a sewing from the heart for, uh, for today, and this actually is sewing, volunteer sewing by a group of first graders. I thought you might be interested in the volunteer activities of the first graders in my school. For the past few years, our students have prepared a Christmas program to present to a nursing home in our community. With the help of our parents, we incorporated an art sewing activity. Since first grade teachers save everything, we had bags of fabric scraps. We made a simple stocking pattern and started to work. The students traced the pattern onto blocks of fabric and began the tedious job of hand sewing the stocking. Each little hand worked hard as the large needle was pushed through the fabric. Tongues hung out of little mouths to make the task easier. Finally, our task was completed and the small stockings were filled with goodies brought from our homes. The nursing home residents greatly appreciated our songs and our visits, but they seemed to remember our tokens of love made with the small hands of first graders. Thanks again for your inspiring program. Sincerely, K.W. Francioli and of Northport, Alabama. K is a teacher in Northport, Alabama. And Kay, I do thank you for sending me this information about your first graders. You know, volunteer work and helping those in need or helping the elderly or helping those less fortunate is not limited just to adults. Even little children, these little first grade children in Northport, Alabama, have spent a great deal of time sewing a precious gift for people in a nursing home. And you know what? I bet you that those first graders will remember that long after they're not first graders anymore. Thanks, Kay, for writing. Thank you for joining me in my sewing room, and I would certainly like to invite you to be with me next time. Music